This show is brought to you by the Deluxe Edition Network. Head over to the Den Dot Show for other great podcasts. We'll do it live! Fuck it! <laughs> yeah, hey everybody. There you go. Welcome to another episode of Deluxe Edition, the show where we love to dig deep and chat about pop culture. My name is Bill Seabald. Here, as always, with Mr. Casey Shear. And today we have a special guest with us, Mr. Tab Murphy. We're doing things all different today because we usually talk to our guests before we, uh, uh, or we talk to our audience before we talk to our guests. We say, hey, you know, here's what Tab has done. Here's why you know Tab. We're skipping all that and going to try to do a live with you here. Because so, nobody gives a shit about Tab. That's why we're skipping all this. Oh, I see. No, our, no, I think I'm our kidding. fans will be. Yeah, I think our fans are going to. The stuff that you do is going is right up our wheelhouse. The 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 properties you have worked on as a writer. Um, that this is a great question to start with. What is because to me, I know you from like the Batman cartoons, year one stuff, the the apocalypse stuff. What do most people recognize you for when they see you? Well, uh, first off, let me just say thanks for having me, guys. I'm really happy to be here on this Sunday afternoon. So I, I, you know, I mean, I think the answer to that is fairly easy from my perspective. What most people recognize me from is the the Disney animated features I've written uh, or that I wrote in the, a block of them in the nineties. So they started with Hunchback and then Tarzan Atlantis, and then ended with uh, brother bear. So like a 10 year stretch, I was, uh, doing nothing but working on those films. So Gorillas in the Mist was yours too. Did that, the success of that, then get you more Disney work and then you stayed with Disney for a while? Well, the Gorillas in the Mist was my, I consider that sort of my big break, even though I had been working as a screenwriter in in, uh, sort of off and on in Hollywood since 1983. I got my first job uh, at Paramount. But uh, Gorillas in the Mist is really like, the one project that came along that just thrust me, you know, sort of into a, a, a different realm in terms of like, instead of meeting, uh, you know, junior, junior executives, I was meeting, sitting in the room with people who could green light movies, you know, because that's just what happens when you, uh, you know, get an Oscar nomination. And, and I, that came fairly early in my career. So I was very fortunate. It just it just gives you a, a visibility that you otherwise wouldn't have, and so people automatically just reach out and want to you know sort of talk to you, work with you, et cetera, et cetera. But how Disney came about was the fact that everybody that I had worked with at Paramount in my very earliest jobs had moved over to Disney, and I'd made some connections there. Jeffrey Katzenberg was heading up now the animation division at Disney. And so he sent out feelers to me and other writers that he had worked with uh, because he wanted to bring a, a live action sensibility to the development of, their, of the Disney feature animated projects that heretofore or had been done internally with a lot of story artists and et cetera, et cetera. So he, he wanted to bring actual screenwriters in to help and assist in that, uh, in that process very early on. So that's, uh, that's how I came to, to end up working at, came to be working at Disney. Yeah. Cool. All right. So yeah. when, when you're writing, are you, do you like the chance to be able to write for animation better because you get to be a little bit more imaginative, I guess. I, I got to well, think that's more fun. Yeah. That's an, I mean, in those days, I mean, you know, like, and if I'll, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I almost, I kept saying no to Disney when they sort of made overtures because of the fact that it was animation because of the fact that the true uh, renaissance of Disney animation had yet to begin. So I still perceive them as kids, little kids, you know, cartoons, you know what I mean? Uh, Erroneously, as it turned out. But in my head was in live action movies. I was uh, trying to get a movie off the ground that I wanted to direct, a script I'd written. And so, you know, my focus was really sort of narrow and it, it, did not include uh, writing for Disney at that point. And then, you know, a couple of things happened and I finally decided to just go in and have a meeting and see what, what, you know, that what they were doing and what, because, and, and here's a couple of things that happened. I was living in Jackson hole at the time and I went to see beauty and the beast and I thought, wow, that movie really knocked me out because I saw it, 
I hadn't been to an animated movie for Disney animated movie in years. So in, in this idea that I had, it was just cartoons for kids was totally shattered in that experience of watching Beauty and the Beast. Cause I saw great storytelling. I saw great acting, if you can call it that, like, but voice acting and great animation, great art. And I saw a movie that worked on several different levels, one for kids, obviously, but another that was more sort of geared towards uh, adults as well. So I thought, wow, this is, you know, you know, and, and right about that time, I got the movie I was trying to get off the ground financed, but I had I had to wait for the actor for a couple of movies. So I had this eight month window before we could even go into pre-production. And so when they and right at that round that time, Disney reached out again, and said, why don't you just come in for a meeting? And and so I said, OK, why not? You know, because. Uh, I have to pay bills too, <laughs> you know, like, so I was thinking, well, gosh, I need a job. So why not go in and, and see what, uh, what they were, what they were working on. And that led to Hunchback, which is so weird because now when I think back and look at all of those times, I was saying, no, no, uh, you know, it, the lesson for me really was that sometimes opportunity you know, it doesn't come up and smack you in the side of the head with something you really want to do. Sometimes opportunity kind of sneaks up and keeps bugging you till you pay attention to it. And when I paid attention to it, finally, it ended up becoming a huge part of my career. You know, I could have easily have just said no and, and moved on. But uh, and, and, and probably the reason <laughs> I'm talking to you today, you know, in, in many ways. So. Uh, uh, so it was really cool. So Hunchback became the first thing I did for them. And and that was a no brainer for me because I was a monster nerd. I grew up in the 60s. I was a total monster nerd. and I was aware of that story of Hunchback and the sort of tragic tale of Quasimodo and Esmeralda. And, and uh, so that that I mean, the minute they said we're trying to do something with this, I said, I'm in. I'll do it. <laughs> you know, that was just like. So, and that put me, set me on a course for the next, uh, you know, 10 to almost 12 years of my career. So, I remember going to see that. I remember I, I went with my, my ex wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and it was like, we we're a little too old to go see cartoons, but this looks pretty good. And we went and we were like, this was pretty good. This was really good. So, yeah. well, you know, thank you. And I appreciate that. And I, 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 you're talking about Hunchback, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, so many things came together right at the like lightning striking in a lightning in a bottle kind of moments for me to end up working on that for the studio to even want to develop something that had a, a very mature sort of themes running through it. And uh, I don't think that movie would get made at Disney today. So, but we, we got away with murder on that movie, dude. I mean, we just got away with murder because I think uh, Disney in particular, we're, we're really trying to sort of stretch their boundaries and, and push the envelope a little bit beyond just sort of the tried and true fairy tale musicals they've been doing up to that point. So, you know, we ran stuff up the flagpole that I just was convinced they're either going to say no, or we're going to all get fired on this one. <laughs> what they approved it holy shit what is, what's going on here so that was uh that was quite a, you know a, a couple of years of real uh, really cool and it's something that i'd never really experienced in the live action world which kept bringing me back was this idea of sitting in a room with just a bunch of creatives not business people and nothing against business people and executive studio executives but really being in a in a creative environment that was just all about everybody working hard to try to make the best movie uh and you're sitting in a room with artists and these and the directors and producers all of them having artistic backgrounds and just amazing talent and uh i sat in there and i thought shit man i gotta up my game here <laughs> these guys are like a list Art, you know, like the best of the best. Disney spared no expense to make these movies the best, and so they had the best people working on them, and and so it was a uh, it was daunting and challenging, but it, uh, just some of the most creative, great sort of memories that I, I I have of my career for those ten years. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> Bill, I, I have a, I want to jump in here. Uh, I have a question. Tab, do you find it easier 
if you're writing something that has already been written, like as if you're making a screenplay, like, or, or, you know, you're writing a screenplay or an animated film that's already been done, like Tarzan and the, uh, the Hunchback in Notre Dame, do you find it easier to write? Or well, is it harder? It, it, in the case of Hunchback, it was extremely difficult because I knew the material as very sort of melancholic, dark, tragic tale and a great piece of art. I mean, a, a great piece of writing that's just you know, come down through the ages. And yes, there's a story in there, but there's many stories in that book. And they, they were, I was tasked by Disney with finding a Disney animated movie in, in what other people would consider very dark material. So that was daunting and that was really challenging. And so, I mean, I don't think there's a general answer to your question. Sometimes if you get an adaptation of a book that's amazing, you don't have to do too much to it. Like, for instance, when I was asked to do Batman Year One at Warner's, I, I knew that my job was basically just to fade into the background as, a, as the writer and let Frank Miller's work come forward and speak for itself. And there was already a great structure. There were already great characters. There was all, already, you know, like great dialogue. So for me, it was just like really just, you know, writing the script and sort of making sure all the transitions were there. And, you know, you still have to write the thing. But that was, uh, you know, that was an example of an adaptation where, you know, you're it's you're not doing extensive changes to the original source material. Right. So in on Hunchback, we were making some extensive changes. We were plucking the characters out whose stories we knew that the movie was going to you know shine a light on and so that there had to be decisions creatively made all along the way about what would what we'd lose and how do we sort of get rid of a lot of this stuff and just focus on these three main characters and and in particular you know disney had a lot of boxes that they had to check off in order to move forward on any project that they we're going to uh, make into an animated feature. So all those boxes had to be checked off. And one of the biggest boxes is, is magic. There has to be magic in the story. There has to be magic, there has to be humor. There has to... And so I'm like, where's the magic in a very depressing story about a deformed bell ringer who's being you know, kept up in the bell tower and he's you know, like yearning for you know, Esmeralda and you know, there's, you know, and so, so that was a that was a tough one to crack, and it took a while. But really, I think the ultimate, I, you know, sort of a big idea of that was that yes, he lived in a bell tower. Yes, you know, it was sort of dismal in its surroundings, but he had a very rich internal fantasy world that would sort of, when no one was around him, would come alive, and the gargoyles spoke to him, and. The bells didn't seem so ominous. They were his friends, and the place he lived wasn't so shadowy and scary. It was a, a cool kind of like what a kid in a, would look for in a treehouse. Yes, you know, I'm going to hang out up here, you know, sort of thing. So uh, once we sort of got that, and once we realized that he wasn't, you know, that his real want, that's another big thing for a Disney animated movie. What does your lead character want? What do they really want? And I think he... He wanted, I mean, there was a period of in the movie that he kind of, you know, like thought of himself as, you know, for a time as what if, you know, Esmeralda, I'm, you know, would be my girlfriend. But that really wasn't what his true want was uh, it, in the movie. His true want was wanting to belong out and be outside of the bell tower and be accepted by Paris, by the, the citizens of Paris and to walk and to you know, have friends. And, and so ultimately, once we figured that out, we got away from that sort of really awkward stuff of, of him, you know, lusting after Esmeralda, which is what he does in the book and things like that. And uh, it gave us license for uh, Esmeralda to end up with Phoebus, but the audience to be okay with that because Quasimodo's okay with that. He, he gets what he wants, really truly wants at the end of the movie. So Things like that. You know, you talk, you sit in rooms and you really just discuss how the movie's going to go, how it's going to flow, where are we going to find humor, how are we going to offset some of the darker themes, you know, and make the movie accessible to kids as well as parents. But it's funny, dude. I mean, I, you know, 
my partner and I watched the movie not too long ago within the last year, I think the pandemic, and I hadn't seen it. I don't know, 20 years, maybe. I was fucking like, what <laughs> did we get away with in this movie? You know, like the scenes and like, oh my God, you know, like you got Frollo as a 66 year old pervert lusting after a 21 year old gypsy <laughs> woman and he's singing songs, you know, like Hellfire. And I mean, it's just like, that's a Disney. That's not the kind of thing you immediately launch. Go, oh yeah, that's that just screams Disney to me, you know. So we we uh, we had a lot of we had a lot of fun in that film, uh, pushing the envelope. And yeah, you know, we had to we had to push back a little bit, uh, pull back a little bit. But man, a lot of stuff we thought wouldn't fly flew. And I th I just attribute that to that time at Disney when they were willing and open to try different things, you know. So. Mm. I was really lucky to to be able to be the guy, at least from the writer's standpoint, the initial writing standpoint, to be tasked with, you know, sort of trying to help shape that movie. So I, I, I love that film. I do. I love it. It sounds like that production, do you stay on the whole time? So as like creative changes are being made, they say, you know, don't worry, we have the creative expert. Let's bring him in. Is it, is it sort of that kind of committee? Well, you know, it is, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous collaboration between a lot of people. And, uh, and, and I worked on it as the only writer with the directors and the producer, uh, Kirk Weiss, Gary Trousdale, and Don Hahn, the producer. I was the only writer on that movie for about a year. And then I remember, you know, coming into story meeting one day, and there were you know, there were like three other people in the room. And I'm like, huh, who are you guys? And they're like, we're writers. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, like, so there was this moment where you go, you really, because that's, that's the collaborative process. Disney often, and, you know, I haven't been in any situation in those 10 years where they didn't bring other writers in. Mainly because, you know, when you start really going into production on an animated movie, they don't just start animating the movie at the very beginning and then plod their way through all the way to the end. They start animating that movie all along, every scene every, they have, and they're pushing forward this way. And so things change, There's, you know, the ideas come up. And so really one writer cannot be in 16 different places at once addressing changes or ideas. So that's, they bring other writers in to begin to, to do a lot of the detail sort of work scene work uh that arises when when you're heading into production so yeah. but from an ego standpoint for me i was like it was like kind of like oh what i'm being replaced but i wasn't really being replaced it was all silly because those writers that came in were awesome and they were great and they were great collaborators and nobody that's what i loved about working at disney is that nobody was there with any kind of particular agenda of their own the only agenda ever was to make the best movie possible, which allowed everybody just to be egoless in pursuit of that goal, right? So it was really easy to accept other writers coming in and doing great work on, some, on the foundation that I had built. And, and besides, I had to go off it right in the middle of all of that, at least on Hunchback. I had to go off and make the movie I'd been trying to get off the ground for the last four years. As the, so I went away and directed the movie, came back in, uh, came back and still had time to contribute because those movies take a long time to make. I mean, you know, I think Hunchback was three years. I know Atlantis was four years. I mean, so there's ample opportunity to, you know, contribute all, all the way along the, all, along the way. So. Yeah, no, that sounds incredible. The, the movie, so you directed a movie, you, you keep, you keep referencing the movie you directed. I've never actually seen it. So last of the dog men, but I remember it coming out. I remember it being around. Have you directed since? No, no, I haven't directed since. Last you scared know, you away. You, you say no more after. One. Well, not. I mean, a little of that, but not not really. I mean, here's the thing. You know, you get a chance. You finally get a chance. This is, Hollywood is a business, and it's a, it's driven by success financially in terms of what kinds of opportunities you have after a situation where you go direct a movie. That movie, when I was in post-production on that movie, I knew the writing was on the wall because the company that uh, was going to release it had filed for bankruptcy. So everybody was nervous that we weren't going to get much of a release. And sure enough, we were supposed to open in 1,500 theaters and they cut it back to 700, I think. 
on opening weekend, which gives you no chance at all to find an audience at 700 theaters. And so the movie came out and it just, you know, from all outward signs was a flop. Now, you know, one of the things that you look at when you when you kind of look at a uh, the weekend box office take, and ours was dismal, dismal, three million, I think, which is the death now, you know. But then you look closer and you look at what the per screen average w is, which is how many people were in the theater watching your movie. And we had the number one per screen average of the weekend. We just weren't in enough theaters to make it worthwhile so so there you go i mean so i wasn't offered a lot after that movie i think i was offered a tnt movie back in those days like nine you know or whatever and that wasn't something i was really interested in and at the same time i'd been asked to do tarzan by jeffrey and then tarzan led to atlantis and then atlantis led to brother bear and each of those projects is just labor intensive. So it just, you know, I really didn't pound the pavement and break down doors to try to get a second directing gig because I was already knee deep in, a, in, in these movies that were taking up so much time and, uh, and really enjoying myself and enjoying the process and working with people that I really love to hang out with and, and were creative and just great. So. It just kind of, I just kind of went with the flow, as it were. So, have you ever? That's why. Have you ever worked on a, a production where things weren't great? Like, I, I, I always wonder if you ever turn in. Have you ever turned in a story and you go? I just have this vision of it happening. Maybe it never happened, but the writer goes and says, "All right, let me see." They took my my story, they put it on screen, and it's total dog shit. Like it, it, it totally misses the mark. And then your credit is on there. I mean, that's got to be oh, a yeah, real feel, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. I had to wait till very late in my career for that to happen, but that happened within the last couple of years, actually. But I don't want to say too much about it because I had people that I really care about that were working on it that stayed on. I got fired and that stayed on and did the best they could, and I don't want to disparage their efforts. But but overall, I would say in the you know the, I've been doing this now for almost forty years, right? Of all the things I've worked on, I was really, uh, I've been very, really fortunate, man. I mean, you know, most everything that ha carries my name, I'm quite proud of. But uh, yeah, well, that one got away from me. <laughs> I, I knew, I knew early on I was in big trouble, but that's okay. Sometimes you do things and you just uh, soldier through them and, and you move on to the next thing. Yeah, uh, but yeah. uh, but I've been uh, I've been very uh, like I say I've been very lucky that a lot of the things I've done I have had nothing but you know great times great results and there's nothing I, I you know that I would except, except for that one uh, be too embarrassed about uh, even the even my best friend is a vampire which is the very first thing I I sold and the very first thing that got made. And it was just a teen comedy in the 80s. And it's, you know, it still has a certain sense of charm. And for years, I it was like, you know, I kind of hid it in the closet like the the ugly child. <laughs> but hey, I, but I know, just watched I, the over the time you go back and you look and you go, you know, that wasn't so bad. And, you know, like I was at a Comic-Con this last weekend. And I know the only reason I was invited to that con was because the the owner of it is a huge fan of my best friend as a vampire. So what do you say to that? You just go, okay, that's awesome. And he, you know, toward the end, he brought out this big quad poster he'd found in Italy of it that I didn't even know existed. And I'd like signed it and I thought, all right, sometimes you, you do stuff that means something to some people that you just kind of, it's not that you take for granted, but you just don't equate that with success necessarily. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about, it's like our show, we celebrate mostly because it's my passion, the 80s. A lot of the 80s stuff is now coming back. Like, There's going to be a resurgence where all of a sudden you're going to be back from all the 90s and, and 2000s <laughs> Disney stuff you've done. Yeah, you're well, going to be around for a while. Well, I, listen, I mean, the pandemic proved that it wasn't even that I'm going to be back. It's that I never left in a weird way or that, that the movies never left. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic showed to me which uh you know let's take atlantis the lost empire for example 
that's a movie that came out uh, that I did with uh, the same guys I did uh, Hunchback with. And, it, and those guys at that time had earned so much cachet at the studio. We were pretty much given, I don't want to say free reign, but, you know, they, you know, we were given a lot of leash to kind of come up with something original. You mentioned, you know, things that are based on other things. Well, we were given the uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, the green light to come up with something original. And so what we came up with was Atlantis, the Lost Empire. And again, doing something different. There were no songs in that movie. It was a boy's own kind of adventure. And there was great characters and diverse diversity before diversity was even con a concern in Hollywood. I mean, we created the, you know, like we had the first... Uh, person of color princess we had uh, a, you know like I mean we just got to do things that we wanted to do that all of it based primarily on movies that we loved as kids you know that we went to see a lot of them were live action movies that Disney made and other live action movies like journey to the center of the earth anyway we worked long and hard on this everybody was proud of it everybody the movie comes out and it just lays there it does not do the kind of business that that Disney had come to expect from their animated movies. So, and I, I love that film. And I was so, I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken for everybody that worked on it for myself in terms of just what the expectations were, because it's not about expectations about money so much, but the money tells you that everybody saw your work. And as an artist, that's what you want. You want to share your work. So it was a, uh, it was a bummer, man. And so for 20 years, I thought I had written the only Disney animated flop. I mean, you know, that's how I sort of perceived Atlantis. I loved it. I still, but I didn't think much about that movie. It just went, went off, kind of got buried in my subconscious and went off the radar. So the pandemic comes around. We're all locked in. And somebody reached out to me, Tammy Tucky, actually, who runs, runs a, a YouTube sort of Disney interview show. And she said, hey, I'd really like to talk to you if you're open to it about Atlantis. And I thought, okay, shit, I haven't talked about that movie in two decades. Nobody ever asked me to talk about that movie. So, okay, let's do it. So we do a nice, you know, kind of interview. And she asks questions about the movie and the process of writing and this and that. And toward the end, she's like, Tab, I don't think you realize how many fans of this movie are out there. I mean, like, and I'm like, really? And she said, yes. Oh my God, you should go. And she steered me to like a uh, Atlantis uh, fan site, Atlantis, the lost empire posting on Facebook. So I went in there and my jaw dropped because there were like all these people in there, many of them now in their twenties that watched Atlantis over and over again, not in the theater, but on VHS and, and DVD grew up with that movie and and here's all this chatter about all these characters I created and and and, uh, and the story and all of this stuff that I was completely unaware of I mean completely so and and that led to other like you know like oh my god then there's other fan groups for hunchback and there's fan groups for brother bear and there's fan, and suddenly I'm like holy shit you know like <laughs> all of this stuff flying under the radar for me and uh, so it was awesome to kind of come to terms and come full circle to realize, wow, uh, these movies I worked on and everybody who worked on them had a hand in shaping a lot of these kids' childhoods, you know, had a hand in, 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 in being the memorable movies for them that, you know, that were, you know, like I could name the memorable movies for me and you could in your own childhoods, right? And so that was like really cool, really eye opening and really satisfying to have that happen after all those years to know that people did watch those, that they did make a difference. So very cool. Yeah. I mean, those, those kids grow up to have kids of their own. They're going to take the things that really mattered to them. And, and, and I do they remember are, they coming. Are. Yeah, they, they are, are. And they already are. And they continue. I, you know, one of the things I started doing in the pandemic and I, you know, just mention it because it's, it's just my thing. And I, is that I got some, uh, I got some posters, uh, like little eight by 10 posters made up of the movies. And I just started to send them to people out of the blue. I would just go into these, these fans and, hey, how about a signed poster of Atlantis or Hunchback or whatever? And they, they loved it, of course. And so I just started sending, well, I've sent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds all over the world, dude. 
uh, over, you know, like it's just amazing and a lot of fun and people, uh, it's just fun to go into somebody's, you know, instant messenger and said, Hey, it's tab. You want a free poster? And then just freak <laughs> out at him. Oh my God. You know, because it's, it's like, but I can't tell you how many posters I sign to like their babies, you know, like to, can you sign when he's only 18 months old, but I know he's going to love this movie. We're going to show it to him. And someday I'm going to bring him out this poster. And I'm like, so you know, you're right about this sort of legacy, this idea of a legacy that is passed on, you know, and it's and it's really cool. It's great to, to sort of be associated with that, to know that these movies will still live and breathe long after I stop, <laughs> probably. So it's yeah. uh, it is cool. It's very cool. My last question for you before I pass it over to Casey, what's what's your day like in your professional industry right and and my experience with writers is like chevy chase and funny farm where most of the days go by he, he has writer's block and can't think of anything yeah. are you working on several projects what do you maybe you could even talk about what you're working on now yeah i can i'm writing a a, a netflix documentary on kangaroos uh which is really cool really cool i mean you know like i always you know stay open to everything because i just, you know there's just so many cool things that i'm interested in and so I've never sort of like pigeonholed myself as I'm only going to write this, only this, you know. So I do all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, I don't know if you saw The Haunted Swordsman, but I wrote a puppet short. I mean, you know, like, and because I just thought that's fucking cool, man. I mean, I like, I'm not going to not say no. I'm not going to not say yes because I, so, oh, I only write this. No, I mean, I... I love all sorts of stuff. Storytelling is storytelling, right? So I'm writing a Netflix documentary, the narration and, and the footage is just spectacular. I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm writing my first or video game, I guess. So that's new territory for me. I've never done that. Uh, and it's really essentially not like screenwriting. It's so different. And, you know, I have to like turn my brain to a whole different pattern but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of world building. It's a lot of, you know, it's just, you know, so there's all sorts of cool stuff. And I got a series I'm trying to get off the ground and I have a feature that is being cast right now, which is a remake of an old ghost story called the changeling. So there's all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff. Oh, wow. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Awesome. The, the haunted swordsman is great, man. Do you, you said, oh, us, you sent me so that the other day. yeah, you got that to is, see it. That's, that is isn't really that awesome? good, man. So good. How did yeah. something like that come up? That was an Indiegogo thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, or uh, uh, was it? What was it? Kickstarter campaign. Okay, I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, first of all, uh, you know, uh, the, the real accolades go to uh, Kevin McTurk, who is the puppet master, uh, the the puppet guy. He makes them. He, he you know, and he and he is uh, he is so talented. So and and. Uh, I'd actually been invited by a mutual friend to go see a short he'd made before Haunted Swordsman. This friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to this buddy of mine's uh, a short he made. I said, oh, yeah? I said, what's, what's, what is it? He said, well, I don't know, but it's, 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 um, it's a puppet movie. I'm like, puppets? Okay, I'll come, I guess. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I wasn't a puppets really, and I'm thinking, you know, sock puppets. Hey, boo, 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 you know, like so. I go to this thing, and it's fucking knocked me like out the back of the theater. It was so cool. It was so good, and it was such a great mix of artistry and music and storytelling. And I was just blown away. So, you know, afterwards the screening, I just went up to him and I introduced myself and I said, "Dude." It, whatever you're doing next, if I have a chance at working on it or writing it for you, don't hesitate to call, you know? And, and I, and so like cut to like, uh, you know, like two months later and I get this call from Kevin, he goes, uh, Tab, were you serious about, you know, like, I, yes, I'm serious. So we, you know, and he, it turns out he wanted to do a samurai puppet kind of fantasy, scary thing. And I love samurai movies. And so we both just, you know, we just hammered out uh, some ideas. I went off and wrote the script. They did a, he did a Kickstarter campaign. I think he was like hoping to raise like ninety thousand dollars. I think he raised I, I want to say one hundred and thirty or forty something like that. And wow. so we we uh, we took that money and we went and made the short. It was awesome. And yeah, it's uh, really good. 
Yeah, we were hoping to sort of like sell it as a series, and we got a lot of close uh, nibbles, but no firm bites. And I think people just loved it. They loved it, but they just didn't quite know what to do with it or how they would market it or where it would belong and whatever. But it's not dead. We're not. We're just going to wait for Hollywood to catch up to us. Sure. Did I read that they were Stephen King? short stories or something was it uh, uh no that's the passenger i adapted okay. a stephen king short story for another friend of mine filmmaker friend who you know had raised money and needed a script and you know i don't mind writing you know like sure it's always good practice for me to write stuff and to stay sort of sharp and so writing that was a lot of fun writing the hot and swordsman was a lot of fun we ended up you know i ended up writing the whole feature and then we divided it up into the episodes and so we were ready man we were ready to go and we'll still be ready to go but that was that was great fun yeah but you know again great storytelling is great storytelling and these days i mean you know it doesn't really matter the medium you know there's just so many avenues for content and so many opportunities to write stuff you, if you just sort of said to yourself oh well, i'm going to write as tv or feature films and in at least in my case and i'm cutting myself out of a lot of uh, other opportunities to just do cool stuff you know sure all right this is the this is the part of the show where i usually take over and do fan questions but, but we don't have any fans so, <laughs> so, <laughs> no that's not that is not, that is not the case Tab. you can break it to me break it to me that is <laughs> wait oh. there goes my only fan away on his harley <laughs> that is not the case and you know that because you're a part of the group I posted okay. to your group. I know which we're gonna get to in a second, and the group was like, "Fuck you! We obviously you're new here. We know. Yeah, I know. We don't care. Know about <laughs> what? Talk to Tab. We talk to that fucking guy every day. What do we need? What do we care? <laughs> you know. Like, <laughs> so I know. You, I, you that's, mentioned... what I, that's what I was worried about. <laughs> no, you mentioned the Facebook group. Uh, the the that you found that your movies had a life on Facebook and, you know, the groups and stuff that survived. So tell us about this group, the tab Murphy movies, magic and mayhem. How did this, how did this come about? <laughs> well, actually, you know what that came about because, uh, I was dividing my time between the Atlantis group and hunchback and brother bear and trying to, you know, post stuff. And, you know, people are really fascinated with the process. I, you know, they really want to know, and they get into minutia, you know, they get into the minutia of how things were conceived and how they were executed and why were these decisions made and what was this character and we have questions about this and that, which I, you know, I just thought they're fucking nerds, man. But I was a nerd as a kid, total nerd. And I loved movies and I wanted to, if I could have had access to creator or to writers or to ask them questions about the movies I was nuts about, that would have been like Nirvana to me. So I just thought, you know what? I, I don't have a problem spending time answering questions and, and being available to that sort of stuff because I appreciated the interest because I could connect to it directly, man. So Tab Murphy, uh, movies monsters and mayhem really was a place to come that wasn't any sort of movie specific we could talk about all movies i mean I, I, so the, like i post all sorts of stuff and it's gotten more it's a it was a more personal page right so i post stuff about myself and my journey through this world and i post stuff about the movies i post i'd like to have a lot of fun so i you know post questionable jokes at times and, and really i mean i think people come there and uh, i've heard this mentioned a few times it's just a place that's all welcoming everybody's cool it's a fun place to hang out and uh, you know and and if you know people post questions and or they post a lot of times they just rake me over the coals, which I don't mind. They just come in there to just, you know, make memes about me. To, you know, like, just go, you know, like, I'm just fair game. I'm like, I call myself cannon fodder on that page, but I love it. Let them, you know, so they have a lot of fun, but they're all very, uh, you know, they're there for the very same reason. The collective reason is being that they, 
these movies meant something to them when they were kids and they get to hang out with the guy that at least in from their perception you know brought them to life you know me and 300 other people by the way that deserve far more credit <laughs> than i do as the writer uh but so you know we just have a lot of fun it's great it's a great place i hang out um uh, and you know that's pretty much it do they ask yeah, you questions question. like about their do they ask you like uh you know what was Tarzan's, you know, favorite kind of under, uh, you know, like what, what kind of questions yeah. would they ask you? Would yeah, you just make up answers on the fly? The biggest one going around now was Tarzan a virgin when he met Jane. I mean, try to answer that question. dude. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, that that's on their minds. They want to know the answer. Like I have some sort of insight about whatever that would look like. Uh, but no, that it's, you know, like it's, it's all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. No, wow. it's, yeah, that's fun. Most, of it, most of it's geared around fun and funny and joking around and stuff. But no, there's some serious discussions that go on in there, too. So about the movies, about life, about everything. So it's kind of a catch all. But it's also, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's it, it's just a place to check into. And, you know, uh, you know, certainly during the pandemic, it was a diversion when the world and it continues to be when the world seems to be, you know, sort of like spinning out of control, but, but it's fun and it's great. And, you know, they call me uncle tab and that's what I am to them. I'm the, <laughs> the drunk uncle who created all their, <laughs> their, 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 the movies that meant something when they were kids. So there you go. How many people can say they have a drunk uncle, uh, you know, that's available to them on Facebook that they wrote all their movies, you know, so that, that's me. <laughs> yeah, it's, if there was... it's a great group. It's uh, I I joined the other day, and uh, you're very active on the group, and uh, it's uh, that's very cool to see. Yeah, it's you know it is. I, again, I liken it to just my own yearning when I was a, a kid. Uh, like you know, there was no internet. There was nothing. Movies were a big mystery. Everything was a mystery. I mean, the great thing about you know these guys and gals on this page is that most of them are in their, I would say their mid twenties to the early thirties. They were all young kids growing up on my movies, but now they can, they have access to the answers to the questions they have about those movies. So I don't mind, you know, going on and answering those questions because I have a nostalgia for, for that feeling of, you know, of wanting and, you know, just, being so intensely passionate about something that wanting to to know certain things so i you know i try to answer their questions man except sure. was tarzan a virgin when you met <laughs> i will not i refuse to answer that one all right before uh before we get into my questions we do have one fan question right here tab that just popped up uh, I can't see who it is because they're from Facebook and they didn't say <laughs> well, there to uh, ever be a my name. best friend is a vampire sequel. Uh, that's, you know, that's okay. I was just going to dismiss it with a joke, but it's kind of an interesting question because the producer of that movie, we uh, had approached me, I think about five years ago about not doing a sequel so much as a remake. So, uh, I don't know. You know, never say never. Everything old is new again. Everything comes around. You send it out into the universe. It swings back. It, you know, that just a quick aside about that movie, about that that script in particular. I had been in Hollywood, and I had been, uh, I, I I had gotten an agent, and I had been writing scripts, uh, and. Uh, you know, scripts I really liked uh, that I thought, you know, I and this was going through my I'm going to be a dramatic screenwriter phase. And and uh, and, and I was getting meetings, but I wasn't uh, nothing was really happening. I wasn't getting jobs off them and I wasn't certainly selling them. So I remember specifically sitting down one day and saying, OK, fuck it. You know, I'm going to write the most commercial movie that comes that pops into my brain. I'm just going to do it. And the first thing that popped in my brain was I was a teenage vampire. And that is a result of those movies from the 50s. I was a teenage Frankenstein and I was a teenage werewolf. I thought, well, they didn't do I was a teenage vampire. I'm going to write that. And so that's what I did. And I wrote it literally in like, I don't know, two weeks maybe. <laughs> and uh, and it went out on a, on a Friday. I remember it. I had a William Morris agent at the time, and it sold on Monday. 
right? Wow. So, I mean, it taught me a lesson that, you know, like you have to also, you know, in addition to writing all this stuff you're really interested in that's not per being perceived as commercial, you do have to write things that people want to see. You know, you do have to. So, a, you know, a teen comedy about uh, a kid uh, who, you know, wakes up one morning and discovers he's a vampire and has to go to high school and lead a normal life was just at that time in 1983, I think, when I wrote it, or 82. Or, it's just part of the zeitgeist, you know. So it was great that it sold, but it was also kind of depressing. <laughs> it was like, oh, shit. All these other masterworks over here, and they're buying I Was a Teenage Vampire. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a few guests on this show that are like, man, don't bring that one up. Come on, man. <laughs> Read the room. Don't bring that one up. <laughs> well, exactly. I can say I just watched it the other day, and I, I try, try again. I liked it. I, I mean, I think it still holds up. Oh yeah, you know what? It's Jess and I watched it in uh, we were in Jackson Hole a few months back, and and we watched it, and that's what I mean is like I had, hadn't seen it, in, I don't know forever, dude. That fucking movie came out and it flopped, and I got to tell you a story. I was that movie. I was so excited when that you know I got a movie in the theater, and I'm gonna go see it. I'm gonna go see it alone. I'm gonna sit with the crowd and just like to like see what their reaction is and i go to the theater out here in the valley on a friday night a friday night which is open it's just open so there should be a crowd right three people in the theater oh. i walk in and I, three people in the theater and i sit down two of them leave about 30 minutes into it and i'm like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> is this i'm watching the end of my career i'm watching my entire plan master plan disintegrate before my eyes so uh but the irony is, three months later, Gorillas in the Mist opened, and it did, and I, and I got an Oscar nomination. So that just shows you how whoop, 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 you can, you know, you know the, the craziness of, of, of the movie business, you know. So two, I had two movies released in 1988. The first one, My Best Friend is a Vampire, and the second one, Gorillas in the Mist. So thank God, Gorillas in the Mist was in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh man! Crazy. All right, time. so I, I heard you mention uh, a couple times in that in our last segment about an agent. Do you have to have an agent as a as a writer in Hollywood? I wouldn't say that's necessarily true these days. A lot of people go for managers. Some people just have a lawyer. But you know, you have to understand that when I broke in back in the early '80s. The studio system was still firmly entrenched, firmly in place, and there was a just a you know there was a there was a schematic in place for how Hollywood worked, and that is that people had agents, and agents helped you get meetings with producers, and producers helped you get meetings with studios, and some producers had deal with studios and helped you get movies made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, you know these days that whole sort of idea of an agent of needing an agent is a little murky because uh, at managers now are sort of o overtaken. I would say the day-to-day -day boots on the ground work that they do for their clients, which used to be done by agents. Agents tend to be more like come in and help you negotiate a deal. You know, I'm sure there's some, you know, the great old school agents that still get, get, you know, get you into the door you need to get into. So it's a, it's it, that whole process is in a state of flux right now, you know, but I teach it, you know, I teach a couple of screenwriting classes and everybody wants to know, and do I need an agent? To, you need somebody, you need an advocate, you need somebody who believes in you, whether that's an agent or a manager or, a, you know, a lawyer, somebody who can open a door for you, somebody who can get your work in front of the eyes that need to read it. Absolutely, you do. Uh, but that's in the in the old days, and I say the old days when I broke in because they feel like the old days now. Hollywood is changing so much. It, that was an agent. That was an agent. Not so much managers and lawyers. So now that's sort of that playing field is leveled a bit. You know. Sure. Uh, all right. We got another fan question here. Before I jump into my questions, Jason would like to know 
Uh, his son is a writer, and uh, he might dabble in it a little bit. Advice to aspiring writers, whether it be a screenwriter, novelist, or whatever. Well, don't dabble, my friend. <laughs> That's like saying, I want to dabble in brain surgery. What do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, writing is, you know, it's a great creative outlet. If you want to dabble, keep a diary. If you want to dabble, write short stories, write little things that make But if you're serious about becoming a writer, a, a screenwriter or a novelist, you need to, you know, you need to have a fire in your belly, my friend, because it's a, it's, it's a difficult, uh, a long process to ultimately, probably what you mean is to, to get hired or sell a script or, you know, that's, you, I mean, you know, so it, 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 it just takes a, a, com a commitment that most people are not willing to make, you know, ultimately when they find out what's involved. But if you're, you know, if you're really, you know, like you got a fire in your belly and you got to write, you got to write a screenplay and you've got an idea, then more power to you, you know. And the only thing I would then suggest is that you try to, you read a lot of scripts so that you at least see what they look like on the page. You know, you begin to, you know, mimic that. Get a screenwriting software, maybe take a screenwriting class just to get your feet wet, workshop your ideas with fellow writers. That's a great also way to start to get into the, into the groove of it. But it is, yeah, it's, a, it, it, you know, it's a commitment, man. And uh, so think about that, you know, you're a good guy giving advice. I'd be like, here's what you do. Cause I don't want any competition. Take your script idea, write it on the back of a napkin, put it in the bottle, throw the bottle into the ocean and wait for Hollywood to get it. If it circles back and it's dry, go for it. Uh, no, no, no. Listen, I listen. I look. I, I, I'm a big proponent of people finding a creative outlet. If you want to write a script, write a script. If you want to write a story, write a story. If you want to sell a script, that's where things get a little dicey. If you want to just like, if you want to like flex that muscle that we all have, that creative muscle in some direction and that might include writing a script more power to you i mean you know but it's i think a lot of people want to get into screenwriting because they you know i don't want to say for the wrong reasons but you know they there's a perception that oh that there's big money to be made or i want to get a movie made i want to walk the red carpet and i want to do all this kind of stuff that's the wrong reason to become a screenwriter or a writer or any writer. I mean, you know, writing, whether it's screenplay writing, novel writing, short story writing, poetry, whatever, is an expression of yourself and who you are and what you're about and what makes you up. And and that's what should drive this desire to write is to put a part of yourself on the page, you know, through a story. And uh, so if that's alive and well in you, then that's great. Take the next step, I would say. Now, I would say too, his son, I'm guessing he's like, I got to write the next Marvel movie. I <laughs> love Marvel movies. That's my son's, you know, like my son called me up, dad, can you get me an interview with Kevin Feige <laughs> at Marvel? Because I just have the next, you know, Avengers movie in my head and I can't get rid of it. And I'm like, dude, you're my son, you know, like, don't embarrass me like that. Jesus. <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, that's so that kind of passion is good, too. I mean, you know, those movies are going to be around for a while. And uh, and so, yes, I mean, you know, I, I always say, you know, go for it, man. Just just express yourself. Don't be too tied into uh, you know, that it has to sell, that it has to, you know, get made into a movie or all die. No, like express yourself. And then that's the first thing you need to do. Yeah. The, the part about don't just dabble. I, I think that's a great lesson for anybody young now. And, and, you know, I work in other industries outside of writing, you know, for Hollywood and I'm seeing a lot of, you know, people who really aren't passionate about too many things and, you know, most kids yeah, aren't, but yeah. it seems to be a problem now where more aren't than, than I remember. But yeah, I mean, have that passion. And if you're not passionate, I don't know how you grow. And well, if you're not I, growing, how do you get to the top of the crop? Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're a true artist, 
if you're really true, whether you're a writer or you're an artist or a sculpture and, and you're doing something because you just can't imagine doing anything else, this is a calling. It's not a hobby. It's not, you're not dabbling. This is what you have to do. Then you make a pact, man. And what the pact you're making is you're not going to have a normal life. Sorry. You did not. Because, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're just not going to live a a normal life that includes security and, you know, all of this financial security and all these things, you're going to be walking a fucking tightrope without a net for a lot of your career. That's what you have to either accept or I always get a kick out of, you know, like, you know, people have come to me and said, I really want to be a screenwriter and I really want to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and, you know, finish my engineering degree to have something to fall back on. I said, okay. In my mind, I'm going, well, you're never going to be a screenwriter. Okay, and I'll tell you why. Because the minute you have a fallback plan, you just, you just, you just put yourself in a position of like, oh, I can fail because I have this over here. When you put yourself in a position of, I can't fail because the only fucking thing I got to do in my life and I got to make it and I'm going to make it and I, I, there's no safety net. That's, you know, to me, that's what a true artist does, you know. They, they, they don't have fallback plans. You know, that's why most artists are like, you know, you know, there's how many go to any, you know, farmer's market in any city in any given Sunday. And you see tons of artists there trying to sell their their expression of themselves, you know, through their jewelry, through their paintings, through their this or that. You know, they've accepted that. I mean, they may have other jobs. They may do that on the weekend. I get that. But for the most part, if you want the kind of success you dream about as an artist or a writer or a filmmaker or this, then you're going to be walking that tightrope without a net at some point. You just are. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was at a farmer's market in LA. I saw they were selling scripts. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can get a couple of mine at a discount price. <laughs> Tab, you mentioned earlier that uh, you get most recognized for, you know, a bunch of your animated stuff. Uh, that yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm the opposite. I came to know you because of uh, one of our other guests, Gregory Scott Cummins, who was oh, in Greg. your film uh, <laughs> Lost to the Last of the Dogmen. Yes, so, Greg. Uh, do you have any quick uh, Gregory I Scott? You have Cummins him on your show, man. That's a that guy's a 49ers fan, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Greg. I love Greg. I tease him all the time. He's a, he's terrific. He's a lot of fun and. Uh, I'm sure it was a lively conversation. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Do you have any quick uh, Greg Greg stories for us? You know, I, you know, Greg. Well, I do have a. I'll tell you a, a quick Greg story. He you said know, to I, mention something about the strip club in in Vegas. <laughs> I bet he did. I bet he did. <laughs> uh, no, uh, here's the thing. When I was casting, and I, you know, like the movie, this. Even though the, it was kind of a small part, it was a pivotal part, and it was sort of like a convict, uh, you know, sort of role, and he had to be a badass and somebody that you believed and feared. And we read a lot of people, and you know, a lot of good actors, and they were fine, but nobody came in and just like fucking blew me away, you know. And that's kind of what you hope for in a, when you're casting is that somebody will sit down in front of you. And, uh, and and not only sort of look the part, but immediately get into character and just kind of, you just kind of go, whoa. And that's exactly what Greg did. He came in, he sat down, he was just the sweetest guy. He was like talking and stuff and I'm, you know, like talking and, 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 and then, and then we get to the part. Well, and I said, okay, well, why don't we just go ahead and why don't you just uh, read this, you know, like a couple of lines that you have in this scene. And, and he kind of turned away like this. <coughs> And then he turned back and he had just become somebody else, <laughs> like the the character. And he just had the, and he, you know, like uh, he did this thing where he clicked his finger and he, and he just, and, and like he just commanded attention and he commanded the room in that moment. And I just, in my mind, I said, you just got the job, dude. <laughs> You're the guy. You're the guy. He was so good. And so and he was good in the movie too, but he's the sweetest guy. He gets he plays a lot of bad guys, but he's just a sweetheart. 
You know, yeah. he's, a, he's a great guy and he's a, he's a lot of fun to talk to. And we have a rivalry over football and, and, uh, <laughs> You know, the Blu-ray for Last of the Dogman, it's never been released on Blu-ray, but it is coming out on June 6th of this year. And uh, I'm so excited, but I'm excited for people, you know, like like Greg, who were in the movie. And um, I did a whole new commentary track uh, for it uh, with the producer. And we did a transfer, stunning 4K transfer. So I'm so excited for that. J June 6th. Mark awesome. wonders, yeah. So, so what's it like? Uh, what's it like working with Tom Berenger? Uh, Tom was, I love Tom. Tom was great. I mean, you know, he, he was. Uh, he read the script. He really liked it. I met him uh, in L.A. a couple of times. We had dinner, and uh, he, he, you know, I I think Tom's kind of a bit more on the conservative leaning side of politics and I'm a bit more liberal, you know, that's back in the day, long hair and shit. But I sat down beside him and he kind of gave me the side eye. But then I started talking about growing up in Washington and hunting and fishing and eating wild game. And all. And then he kind of leaned in like, Oh wow, that's really cool. You know? So, so we ended up hitting it off really well, but Tom was a, uh, was terrific uh, for me uh, as a first time director. He was very patient and, uh, and he was, he just had an ease about himself that he could be standing with the crew talking and being very genial and and eating his breakfast burrito and i would say okay we're ready for you and he just hands his burrito to somebody here hold this go, go do the shot and get boom right into care get it in two takes and get back and start eating his burrito again and chatting with the crew i mean he just was a uh, he was terrific he was a lot of fun to work with and he uh you know i i really you know it was a tough tough shoot uh, because we started in Mexico and, uh, you know, such a weird thing, the way the finance of the movie came together, the movie set in Montana. And so I get this call. Well, it, it, good news and bad news. The good news is you get to make your movie. The bad news is you can't film a frame of it in the United States. So I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? Where am I going to find Montana in fall or summer into fall? And then they said, and you have to start shooting February 1st. I'm like, what? <laughs> so uh, these are the things, you know, you just get sort of like your head spins and you kind of have to, you know, pivot and reconfigure certain things. And I, so I was scouting locations outside of Vancouver, uh, Canada, which we all know is not Montana. That's the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and, but we, we still needed to start somewhere. And, and Tom was actually the one who said, hey, I, I made a movie years ago down in Mexico in this place where there are pine trees and mountains. And it looked like Montana to me. So we all went down and did a recce and scouted it. And sure enough, we found mountains and pine trees. And so we actually began shooting down there. And by the time we were halfway done with the movie, winter had sort of receded from the mountains I really wanted to shoot in, which was the Canadian Rockies in uh, Alberta. And we were able to move the whole production to Alberta for the second half of the movie. So, yeah, but it still, it was, it was a difficult shoot. We shot for like 68 days or something like that. Wow. Yeah. Long. It's a lot of long, burritos. A lot of burritos. Uh, yeah, it was a long shoot and it was a tiring shoot because most of it was, uh, there was very, you know, most of it was, you know, on location and, you know, so, uh, yeah, but anyway, it's, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was good. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, great movie. I highly recommend it for anyone. And uh, where can people uh, pre-order the Blu-ray? Right now, um, I don't think you can pre-order it until probably, I want to say, May. Okay. But I know the Kino Lorber is the company releasing it. They're, they do a great job with a lot of you know DVD restorations and things. But you can order it off their website, I believe. And eventually it'll be available on Amazon and all the usual outlets. So, you know, sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. So I just have a few more questions. Looking back on your career, do you have any regrets? I I've watched a bunch of your interviews and uh, tried to prep as much as I could for this without, you know, asking questions that have already been asked, but I, I heard that you turned down toy story. <laughs> do you look back? Do you look back at your career? And, and I mean, you, your career is amazing. I mean, you've 
you have nothing to be ashamed of. Everything is great. But do you look back and think, fuck? Uh, well, you know, here's what I do. I look back and I wonder what my career would have looked like if I'd have said yes to that. But uh, I don't look back with any regrets. You know, I, I it's life's too short, you know, and, and uh, what's done is done. And in and I don't beat myself up over it either, too. And I'll tell you why, because uh, that was, you know, one of the things they were talking to me about before I actually went in and had a meeting and discovered Hunchback. So first of all, if I had said yes to Toy Story, I wouldn't have gotten to write Hunchback or probably Tarzan because they were kind of right in the, you know, the mix of things in those days. But here's why why it was easy for me in that moment to turn down Toy Story. It was put to me like this. Hey, we just bought a little company up in Marin County and uh, we're going to do our first sort of computer generated imagery, CGI, uh, you know, mo uh, uh, animated movie with these guys. They're really cool. And, and, uh, and, and I said, so what's the story? And they said, well, it's a story about a, a boy and his talking toys. Now, that's all they gave me, okay? And they said, and the caveat is, uh, you have to move to Marin and you have to, uh, uh, you have to, you have to uh, commit to like two years up in Marin County. Now, I, that was an easy pass for me because I was trying to get my movie financed off the ground that I wanted to direct. I had other things, you know, like going on. And so the way that, sort of was presented to me it was easy to say no thanks of course when i went to the theater and saw toy story and realized why didn't they tell me all this other cool shit i might have said yes uh, but you know no it, it, so you know like you just i don't know you, you can't sort of worry about that kind of thing i think uh everything i did and everything every choice i made good or bad has led me to this point and and you know in terms of the credits of the movies i've made i really am proud of you know just about everything that i got to work on so i'm you know i couldn't be happier do i have you know a list spielberg like career no i never was going to have that i just that wasn't that wasn't meant for me and one of the most powerful things i think you can do is you chase something that you're passionate about is that you, you 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 know you have to be able to recognize when something is meant for you and when something isn't meant for you it's just as powerful to recognize when something isn't meant for you than it than it is about you know like putting your head down and just trying to you know bash your way through the door until your brains are spilling out all over the floor. So, uh, you know, I knew, you know, like when I came in, I was like, if I don't direct a movie by the time I'm 25, I'm going to, you know, like, oh, I'm going to be a failure, you know, and I'm going to just like, ah, oh, I'm going to hate myself and this and all that stuff. Everybody pound beats themselves up over. And then when I turned 25, I said, oh, well, okay. Okay. If I don't direct a movie by the time I'm 30, <laughs> then I'm really going to kill myself. You know, and then 30 comes along and I go, yeah, OK, now it's 35. So you just keep moving the scale, man. Don't fucking beat up on yourself. It's hard. You'll get there. Just keep, you know. And so that's that was my and, and so I turned film over on a cold night in fucking the heart of darkness, Mexico on my uh, when I was 37. So that's, you know, so all those years leading up to that, but I still got there. So that, I mean, it taught me a lesson about, you know, you just have to kind of, you know, be able to shift and pivot. And uh, it wasn't meant for me by the time I was 25 to direct a movie. It wasn't meant for me by the time I was 30. I was doing all the right things. I was trying to, you know, it happened when it was supposed to happen. So often our agenda of when we want things to happen is diametrically opposed to when the universe wants things to happen. So somehow you have to make peace with what you want to have happen and know that it'll happen if you just, you know, do the work and are patient, you know, and we're persistent. Those are the, that's, I would say a lot of people ask me, well, what's the key to longevity in Hollywood? Well, persistence and patience and, you know, knowing that things have a life of their own and, you send them out there and oftentimes they come back. And if they don't come back, they weren't meant to be. And you need to just move on. And that's part of the hardest part of writing in Hollywood, I think, uh, because 
you know, they want you to pour your heart and soul into every project that you get hired for. And then, you know, then you have to you know, like divorce yourself from that emotionally because you don't know if it's going to get made or if it's going to get made, as you indicated, if it's going to turn out well or not. You do your job and do it well to the best of your abilities, but you have no control over what happens to it when it sort of goes out, you know, away from you. So uh, anyway, that was kind of a long winding road wow. answer, wasn't it? All good. <laughs> <laughs> Two last questions, and they're focused on uh, gorillas in the mist. I recently saw a piece on uh, 60 Minutes. The tourism in Rwanda is yes. growing, you know, incredibly. Uh, I saw that because of the the gorilla. You know, have you ever been there, or any interest yeah. in? No, I went there during the making of Gorillas in the Mist. Oh, I awesome. went there. You know, I went there. I went to Rwanda. So this would have been in 87, 80, late 86, 87, maybe. I, I went to Rwanda while they were making the movie and I got over there and I, you know, I, I'd already spent enough time on movie sets to know that that's probably the most boring place in the world you want to be. And they had already finished filming the gorillas up in the mountains and, and the wild gorillas. And, and uh, that's really why what I came to see. So I had a buddy who was a, an associate producer on the movie who was also filming a documentary on uh, on the gorillas with uh, Jim Fowler, who used to be one half of the Wild Kingdom team. Uh, Marlon Perkins, and uh, you probably you guys don't even know that that's how old that show was. <laughs> anyway, so they were going into the jungle every day, and I said, "I go with you, Hefe. I I I, I want to see gorillas. I don't care about. I mean, I care about the movie, of course, but." what I'm here to see is gorillas. So I marched into the jungle and saw the gorillas uh, most every day I was over there. And I wasn't there long. I was only there a week, I think, because uh, I had other stuff to do. I was writing something for Amblin. I had to get back to LA. But uh, yeah, that was like probably one of the coolest wildlife experiences I've ever had in my life, sitting face to face and looking in the eyes of a of a mountain gorilla and you just know there's a lot more going on in, in there and that the connection you're feeling is it's kind of sort of so weird in terms of like whatever evolutionary process we emerged from we were probably brothers somewhere along the line down there uh so it was it was really cool really cool yeah i just watched that actually uh this afternoon i watched that uh i still have to finish it i have like 20 more minutes but that is incredible that that whole story. Do you ever think oh, yeah. of writing the second part of Diane Fossey's life? Well, the second, the, part two. Uh, well, that, that would be a short part because <laughs> I, she was murdered, dude. Well, so yeah, I, but don't, I, I don't know I, what. I, I know she was murdered, but I mean, it could be an intro. There's a lot. There's a lot. I, I mean, I, I was just, just now getting into the story of, of her, yeah. but I think there's a lot that could be uh, written about that. Well, maybe i i don't know i i feel like i mean the mountain gorillas because of tourism have found a way to stabilize the populations and in fact they're on the increase because finally the rwandan government understood that if uh, you know tourism dollars they could use tourism dollars to help in the conservation efforts and this sort of this whole thing when i went there there was no i mean there was no big tourism there was a, there was very little of that and the, you know people had uh you know they they lived they farmed the land right up right up to the jungle so somebody the edge of somebody's you know sort of like garden would just be this big wall of vegetation beyond which was the great unknown and we i i there were people that lived right next to the jungle that didn't even know gorillas existed in that jungle in rwanda now the whole country knows and they see it as a viable resource and as they see it as a way to sort of like, you know, tourism as a way to sort of like, you know, uh, not only protect the gorillas and save them, but also to for them to become invested in something in their own country that has meaning to the greater world. You know, so it's a it's it's been a great I think it's been a great thing that that that's occurred. I don't know that I would recognize it if I went back today. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, we hiked in and found wild gorillas. I have hair raising stories of encounters like that. But yeah. So uh, I don't know that you could do that today. That's, uh, you know, and, and rightfully so. I mean, 
They, but they habituate guerrilla groups to tourists and they send them in and you're allowed a certain number of minutes with them and, and that's it. And and these days you pay big money for that, you know. Yeah. So Yeah, so well during I, during her time, you know, they were they were coming in and killing murdering, you know, killing the gorillas and st- sure. stealing them because they were selling them to zoos and that's how they were getting their money. So, yep. you know, tourism yep. taking groups in to see the gorillas, you know, obviously that's a lot better than grabbing you know taking well, out and selling in the zoos and stuff you know well exactly and they were they were decimating the populations i mean you know that they realized that a renewable resource rather than a resource that was being depleted was ultimately going to be you know something that could be sustained and everybody wins the gorillas win you know the country wins the people you know involved in the the tourism trade win and it's all so that's you know the best case scenario obviously yeah yep yeah all right last question here and then bill will wrap it up did you use your oscar nomination status to get backstage to a guns and rose concert no but i wish i would have uh you didn't i read I, that really in something that backstage? you wrote in 2015 I wrote that. Yeah, it was one of those drunk nights with Gregory. <laughs> I I don't recall using my Oscar nomination. Like, first of all, an Oscar nomination is not like an Oscar win. <laughs> and I'm sure that Axel would have said, "Get the fuck out of here, dude." <laughs> That's funny. Oh my so god, that's, I, that's I don't true. recall writing that. I did go see Guns and Roses, you know, like, uh, and, and I saw them a couple of times. And when I, at the height of like uh, the the mania for Guns and Roses in, uh, I want to say the late '80s, early '90s, I was li- I, in the early '90s. I was living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, so I, uh, I, I flew to San Diego to see them alone, but went by myself. And I just said, I got to see these guys. And, and it was awesome. It was a great concert. So, but I. <laughs> no backstage? No. In fact, so it that would have been, I would have been nominated by then. And, and no, I did not use uh, my Oscar nomination to get backstage at that concert. In fact, I had cheap seats way up and these guys were just passing <laughs> joints. And I was like, okay, let's go. So I got so stoned at that concert. Uh, and I never. Well, had which concert that. was it that you used the nomination? I didn't use the nomination. I've never used the nomination in my life. Where'd you get that story, Casey? Who's your source? It was, was something that I found. I can't get I my don't... sources away. Oh. Now, listen, I you know there's a lot of erroneous stuff on the internet about me. Uh, you know, like I just did. You know, some people. I mean, I I think some people are. I don't know that stuff has been posted. Not that I'm a target for erroneous reporting, but <laughs> this stuff gets you know, kind of miss, like there's a, I think going around that I'm only 56, I'm 65, man. So there you go. Uh, or other you things, look great, man. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall ever saying that even drunk. So you know. <laughs> all right, Bill strike that, <laughs> strike that from the conversation. All right. We will fix the internet for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Like, again, you don't use an Oscar nomination. I couldn't even use that to get a good table at the smokehouse here in Burbank. Okay. <laughs> Shit. Nobody cares about nominees. <laughs> <laughs> but I, okay. So there is something floating around that I didn't go to the Oscars that year when I was nominated, that I went fishing in Baja instead, uh, yellowtail fishing. That is completely true. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is a pretty good time. Yeah, yeah that, that, I'd probably do that too. Sitting around at those Oscar shows I heard uh, aren't actually as yeah, fun as they appear. I knew I wasn't going to win, dude. And then the yellowtail bite was red hot. So yeah. I, <laughs> I, I got my priorities, right? <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for, for taking the time to be on the show today. That was a lot hey, of fun. My pleasure. You guys are awesome. Thank you for asking me. I, I feel, I fear I, I'm, you know, I'm suffering from overexposure these days, uh, but uh, I appreciate you're taking an interest in uh, talking to me. I really well, we, we, our yeah, our man. pleasure, our honor. Thank you very much. No All right. So with that, we we just want to tell everybody who's listening. You know, check us out on Deluxe Edition dot show, uh, and you can always find us on the socials. Deluxe Edition Pod. Is there anything Tab you want to direct the audience to? 
Uh, well, you know, they're certainly welcome to check out uh, the website. We have a lot of fun on uh, Tab Murphy Movies, Magic, and Mayhem uh, is the name of it. Uh, not the website, the Facebook page. I, I, I'm sorry. And, of course, any of the other uh, Disney movies have a huge following. And if you're interested in any, I posted a lot of stuff in the archives about, you know, early drafts of treatments and behind the scenes stuff and all that stuff especially on Atlantis, some on Hunchback, some on Tarzan. Check it out. It's cool, if nothing, for posterity. If we go on and put one of your movies on, like, just loop, will you make just money? Will it just, you'll get a check one day? <laughs> <laughs> Can we start a campaign? Is that how this works, yeah. the streaming stuff? Yeah, yeah, there you go. My best friend is a vampire. We'll finally pay off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thanks that's so terrific. Much, Thank we you. Really appreciate it. Uh, guys, it's been a blast. Really, truly really appreciate it.